Um, if any, if my voice is muffled or if you uh, like to see my lips move as I talk, let me know. Um, otherwise, I'll keep the mask on. So security in Drupal, what can go wrong? If there were room on, on the title slide, I would add a word to the second line. What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> Before we get started, did that. Introduction about me. Um, as Kelly said, um, I'm a member of the usability group. I'm one of the co-maintainers of the migration subsystem in Drupal core, also known as the Migrate API. Um, and I'm a provisional member, have been for a few months now, of the Drupal security team. Um, I'm Benji Fisher on most places, but I was too slow signing up to Twitter and someone else grabbed my preferred username, so I inserted my favorite number. Um, my avatar in most of these places is the yellow pig. Um, I wear the silly hat uh, because I come to a conference and sometimes run into people that I've dealt with online and they might recognize my avatar. And uh, it is a pig. It's not a bear, even though this is Asheville. It's a yellow pig. And uh, if you search for 17 yellow pig, you will find out the origin of that. Or you can ask me sometime later. Um, I work for Fruition. Um, our slogan is Build, Grow, Protect. We do digital marketing as well as website design and development, um, security and hosting. And, um, and they sponsor a certain amount of my time to work on contribution for my great usability and, uh, and the security team. So thanks to Fruition for that. Um, you can follow along. Um, slides.benjifisher.info and I think I posted in the uh, Slack channel a link to today's slides. Um, the only thing missing from there um, is the slide reminding me to push the red button. Um, it's a long outline but don't panic. Um, I'll explain in a minute. We're currently in the middle of the introduction. I suppose I should put a green check mark there, as like April had on, on her slides. I'll talk about what is the OWASP top 10. Um, I'll talk about what is Drupal. And then there's the list of the OWASP top 10. These are um, standard classification of security problems that afflict websites. So broken access control, um, I will talk about that one. Um, cryptographic failures, injection, insecure design, security misconfiguration, vulnerable and outdated components, identification and authentication failures, software and data integrity failures, security logging and monitoring failures, server-side request forgery, and then I'll wrap up with a conclusion. Now, don't panic, I'm not actually going to talk about all of those. In fact, if you look at this presentation, you'll see there's a column for each of those, but most of them are blank. And I will focus on two of them in detail. I'll talk about broken access control. Um, and then your choice, I'll either talk about injection or I'll talk about vulnerable and outdated components. Um, and my plan is that each time I give this talk, or a talk with this title, it won't actually be this talk, um, I'll prepare slides and fill out one or two more columns. And in a couple of years, I'll have the whole thing filled out, and then I'll, I'll be on easy street, and I'll be able to give the talk and just say, which two topics do you want to talk about today? Um, but I just added the section on access control, so I will definitely talk about that. And um, I will talk about your choice of uh, one of the other topics. Um, and I want to give some attribution. A lot of the text on these slides is copied from the OWASP website. Um, they have a standard um, attribution claimer. They're, they're using a, a share-alike license. 
and all of my slide decks have a similar license. That's the last slide on the deck. Um, so Creative Commons share alike. So, you know, feel free to borrow uh, anything you see on any of my slides, just give attribution. Um, oh, and questions. Feel free to jump in and ask questions at any time. There, there's a slide at the end that says questions, but don't, don't hold them till the end. Interrupt me. It's, uh, it's the best way to tell me that you're actually paying attention <laughs> and, and learning something from it. Um, and I, I haven't timed this out carefully, so, um, so, so feel free to ask questions. Any at, any at this point? What was the slides uh, you were on at the end? Uh, Slides.benjifisher.info. And uh, this is a React.js presentation, so it's just HTML and, and a little bit of JavaScript and, and some PNG files. Any, ask, any other questions? So what is the OWASP top 10? Um, OWASP stands for Open Web Application Security Project. Haven't memorized that yet, I should. Open Web Application Security Project. It's a nonprofit foundation that works to improve the security of software. Um, it is not Drupal specific, and part of the idea of this talk is let's get off the island, let's see how um, an industry standard organization views security. And one of the big things that OWASP does is they compile this top 10 list um, of the top 10 web application security risks. Um, the most recent revision to the list was in 2021. Um, so they rearranged things, they combined some categories from the, the previous version. Um, and that's the list of things that I went through in, in the introduction. Those are the column headers of this presentation. Um, the top 10 is a standard awareness document for developers and web application security. It represents a broad consensus about the most critical security risks to web applications. And as I said, the most recent revision is from last year. Um, what is Drupal? I, uh, yeah. I, I'm aware that, that there are some beginners at this camp, so I, I should definitely talk about this. And, uh, and, and even if there weren't, because the idea is to, to, to think about security from an outsider's point of view, it's a good exercise, even for those of us who use Drupal every day, to think about, in broad terms, what is Drupal? It's a content management system. So what does that mean? Drupal says, enter data in my forms. I will save it to the database and then generate web pages. And the hacker says, sounds great, let's get started. Um, frankly, from a security point of view, a web CMS, content management system, is the worst idea ever. Like, it's just asking people to try and hack us. And, um, you know, the rise of decoupled sites is a really great thing from the security point of view because you, you, you have the back end that has access to the database, but you, uh, you really don't expose that to people through your front end if you have a fully decoupled site. You're showing them static files that don't have access to the database. But if you're just using a, a basic Drupal site, which has a user login link and, and all of that, um, you're just asking for trouble. Uh, what else is Drupal? It's an active international open source software project. Um, so according to the about page on Drupal.org, the Drupal community is one of the largest open source communities in the world. More than one million passionate developers, designers, trainers, strategists, coordinators, 
editors and sponsors working together. And Drupal takes security seriously. From, uh, from security.drupal.org, it describes the security team is an all-volunteer group of individuals who work to improve the security of the Drupal project. Members of the team come from countries across three continents. The team was formalized in 2005 with a mailing list and has had three team leads in that time period. So we, we've been around for a while. Um, I like to think that we're one, one of the best security teams around, that Drupal takes security more seriously than a lot of other open source projects. Um, and I'm frankly proud that uh, they, they accepted my application to join the team. Thank you. Okay, so now let's dive into the top of the list, broken access control. Um, so there are various types of vulnerability that fall under this heading. Um, so one is called information disclosure. Uh, what, what, what sorts of information are there available on websites that should not be visible to everyone? Passwords. Passwords, yeah. yeah. Maybe address information. Address, any sort of personal information is... is API keys. API keys, yeah. Like, you know, if, if, if someone figures out the API key you use to connect to MailChimp or well, any other web service, they, they can start charging to your credit card by, uh, by, by making sending requests to the services you use. Um, database credentials. You know, Drupal needs to talk to a database and it needs to read and read from and write to that database. And, and you don't want to expose that. Um, editing or deleting content on your website by an unauthorized user. That also falls under um, access control. And I'll say more about this one because it's, it's got this complicated name, cross-site request forgery. And we'll actually look at a specific example of that. And more, if you go to the, the OWASP page describing this, there, there's a long list of, of special types of access control problems. And, and I guess you could summarize the first two. Do you know what the, the acronym CRUD stands for, C-R-U-D? Create, read, update, delete. So any one of those four operations um, requires some authorization. And information disclosure is the read part. Um, edit, delete are the update and delete, the UD of CRUD. Um, and uh, I, I didn't list create separately, but of course you don't want someone to create a page on your website without authorization either. Um, I'll share one horror story. I, I have others. Um, coming from custom modules. So a few years ago, I was reviewing a site that was coming to the agency I was working at at the time. And it had custom access control for the edit page for the account user slash one. And the custom access control left off a knot. So instead of granting access only to user one, it granted access to anyone but user one. I, 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 no one noticed. Anyone else want to share a horror story? What's, what's the worst thing you've ever seen in, in a custom module? Go ahead. I had an entire like PHP application and a template file one time. Does that count? <laughs> an entire PHP application in a template file, a Drupal template. Uh -huh. um, get, that's certainly a, a bad code. practice. It, in theory, it might not be a security problem, but it's certainly suspect. I had a funny one that was uh, not necessarily security, but uh, I forgot to put like a, a page conditional on a, a custom block, 
And so I put this block on like every page that wasn't supposed to go, on, it was only supposed to go on one page. Okay, so for, for the sake of the recording, I'll repeat that. Um, someone put, put a page and forgot to restrict, I'm sorry, put a block on a page, but forgot to restrict it to just that page, so the block showed up everywhere. Um, and you're admitting to making that mistake yourself. I, I am guilty as charged, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That's pretty easy to do. Yeah, that would be <laughs> you know, I, I, I've suggested a session that hasn't been accepted anywhere, but, um, <clears throat> but the session title is How to Stop Making Mistakes. <laughs> and I figure that'll get people's attention once it gets on the schedule. But then if you read the description, it says, humans make mistakes. So the only way to stop making mistakes is to stop being human. If that's not an option for you, let's discuss what we can do <laughs> to manage our mistakes. So, so yeah, uh, owning up to mistakes is, is, is good practice. So thanks for sharing that. Um, so how can you protect yourself? from you know, this, this particular sort of, of problem that, that someone wrote a custom access function and got it backwards. How do you protect yourself from that? Unit testing. Say again? Unit testing. Unit testing, or, or I, I think this would be a functional test, but, but automated testing. Um, any other suggestions? Code review. Code review. Anything else? Um, that's all I came up with too. Um, so, so yesterday afternoon, um, Jonathan was was showing us uh, uh, Cypress automated testing. I, I think that could certainly fit into this framework. Um, oh, I did come up with the third suggestion. Um, so I would say that it's just good practice for any custom code that creates a custom page, or as in my example, has custom access control for a page, there should be an automated test. Um, I think that if our customers recognized the true cost of custom code, of making it just the baseline of security, of adding a custom test, having someone do code review, that would make it more expensive, and they wouldn't ask for so much of it. And, and that's my, my third recommendation for avoiding this sort of horror story. Avoid custom code in the first place. Um, you know, not all custom code is bad, but all custom code is suspect. Um, public code, it's been published on Drupal.org. Um, it has eyes on it. And the more eyes you have on it, the better your chances are of following best practices and not doing anything stupid. I'm, I'm sorry, I shouldn't use that word. Not, not, not making any, any bad mistakes. As far as the word stupid is concerned, my position is that even smart people make stupid mistakes. So, I, so it's not the person who's stupid, it's the mistake that's stupid. That, that's my, my opinion. Um, so I mentioned cross-site request forgery. This is a particular form of, uh, of access control. And the idea is that one site, mysite.com, has an image file where the source is the URL to example.com slash node slash one, two, three slash delete. And suppose an administrator, for example.com, visits mysite.com. What happens? The page loads. It tries to fetch the, uh, the source of the image. And that source is actually the delete form for node 123 on some other site, which the admin happens to be the administrator for. Um, so that's why it's cross-site. The, the image tag goes on mysite.com, but the effect is on example.com. And the trick is getting the administrator for example.com while logged in to visit mysite.com and, and make this, this attack possible. 
and that's why it's cross-site. Although it could also be two different pages on the same site. I think that's still considered cross-site request forgery, even if it's on the same site. Um, so this example is actually not effective. Do you know why? I'll answer it on the next slide if you can't think of why it doesn't work. Yeah? Where you hit a button. Yes. They, we, we require you to hit a button on, uh, on a delete form in Drupal. There is a confirmation form. It's not a one step. Load this page and delete. It's load this page and then press and then submit the confirmation form. Um, and what are the incorrect assumptions that expose similar vulnerabilities? Things like this that, that, you know, that might actually work. So how we avoid CSRF, we use confirmation forms. So this, this is a list of answers to the, the first question. Um, why doesn't it work? Because we use confirmation forms. And if you're writing your own delete pages, you should use a confirmation form. Um, and I, I, I guess the way I phrase this is how to avoid it, but it's sort of an answer to what are the assumptions. Um, the assumption is that if someone visits a page, they got there by clicking on the link that I put on another page to lead them there. And that's a bad assumption. What actually happens is that people can add slash edit to the end of URL. They can add slash delete. They can remove the last component. Um, if they're looking at node slash one, two, three, they might change the one, two, three to four, five, six, just to see what happens. Um, and you know, the vast majority of users are not that curious. They're not that mischievous. But the malicious users out there are, are not only going to do this occasionally, they're going to do it systematically. Um, forms are even worse. So the assumption is I'm writing this PHP code that's going to process this form. The assumption is that the data I'm processing comes from the form I provide it. Oh, well, that is not a safe assumption. Um, someone can easily go into the, uh, just using browser tools, go in and modify what's in the form and then click the submit button. Or if they're just a little bit more sophisticated, they can use a tool like Postman or something um, to send an arbitrary post request that gets processed by your code. So don't assume. Do not assume that the, that the, um, the request comes from the form you have provided. Um, one way to avoid CSRF is to use special tokens. So if you do have a link that immediately performs an action without a confirmation form, Drupal provides um, a convenient way to add a token to the link and then test that, validate that token when you process the code. Um, and just remember, getting back to what I said under the topic of what is Drupal, um, forms are hard. And web CMS is a terrible idea from the security point of view. Um, the Drupal form API has been through several generations, revisions. Um, they've put in a lot of security features. Um, there are you know, tokens generated just for each instance of the form. They are checked when the form is processed. If you are using forms on a Drupal site, don't just give me some HTML form slash input element and blah, blah, blah. Use the form API and use the protections that Drupal gives you. Um, so one thing I, I, I like to do in this talk is, is give an example um, of a specific security problem that has happened to Drupal and that falls under this heading, access control. So there was a cross-site request forgery vulnerability. There's more than one. Um, 
SA Core 2021-006. Quickly. Drupal no. Drup Drupal Geddon was 2014. This is from 2021. Um, so Drupal Geddon is one of the choices for, for, <laughs> for the second thing to go into in detail. Um, so if you look at the security advisory, I've just copied this, this header material to my slide. Um, the project is Drupal Core, the date, the security risk, which is this sort of mumbo jumbo. You can look up the, the key for what those mean. The vulnerability type is cross-site request forgery, and it has a, its own um, CVE, and I should know what that stands for, common vulnerability something. What? Event? Event? Maybe. <laughs> yes. Anyone want to Google CVE? Um, so, so this is how it's, it's communicated. Um, security advisories uh, come out on Wednesdays. Um, the, the, the second option you have for, uh, for when, when I'm finished with this column um, is, is talking about um, in detail how Drupal communicates and how you can follow the security advisories. Um, so this is how it's communicated. And then the description is um, the Drupal core media module allows embedding internal and external media in content fields. In certain circumstances, the filter could allow an unprivileged user to inject HTML into a page when it is accessed by a trusted user with permission to embed media. In some cases, this could lead to cross-site scripting. So that's a description of what can go wrong. Um, and the fix, when, when this came out in, in um, 2021, was to upgrade to the latest version of Drupal, either 9.2.6, 9.1.13, .2 or 8.9.19. So um, this was the 9.0 was already uh, unsupported, no longer getting security fixes. These were the three currently supported versions of Drupal, and they all had releases on that day. Um, if you want to, you can look at the actual code of the fix. I gave a link to the commit that uh, made this change, but I will just summarize that for you. Um, when you're editing a WYSIWYG field with a media embed, so it's not a standalone media reference field, it's embedded in a text field. Um, when you're editing this, Drupal now adds a CSRF token, um, not to a, a link, but to the, the header of a jQuery request, and then we validate that token in the code that responds to that request. So what does that look like? Here I have, this is the same Drupal site that I, I showed you yesterday afternoon. It's a fresh install using the Umami demo profile. And here I have added a page, it's node slash 20. Um, a test page for this vulnerability and just a little bit of text in the body field. See what happens when I preview a text field with a media embed. And then this lovely picture. Um, I figure it's not getting too close to, to lunchtime. You shouldn't be too hungry just yet. Um, but um, what I'm going, oh, we don't need this right now. What I'm going to do is open my browser tools. And I guess, because I was looking at this earlier, I've got the network tab open. And now what I'm going to do is edit this page. Um, and gee, there are a whole lot of requests that get made when I edit that, that page. And here's my body field. And it shows a preview of the picture. I can edit the media. I could add additional text here. You know, this is the Drupal editing experience, right? 
Um, that's a lot of requests. I happen to know what I'm looking for, media. Um, and it's a get request. Um, is it this one? No, I don't think so. Yes, it is. This is what I want. Um, so this is one of the, it looks like, dozens of requests that get made when I open up that edit page. Um, and let me, what, I, what I'm really interested in here are the response headers included in this request. So it's not part of the URL. It's not a query parameter or anything. It's part of the response headers. And I'm sorry, not the response headers, but the request headers. There's a cookie, host, a blah, blah, blah. And down here, second from the bottom, X Drupal Media Preview CSRF token. And here's that token. So, so there you see in action. Um, this is what was done. This is what was added to prevent this vulnerability. So um, if I were really well prepared, I would install the vulnerable version of Drupal 9.2.5 um, and demonstrate how to exploit the vulnerability. Um, I haven't figured that out yet. But I think the point is that a less privileged user, a, a content editor, um, could create this page. Um, Right? Using source view, they can arbitrarily edit the, uh, the HTML in here um, and save the page. And then a more privileged user, the site administrator, can come and open up the edit tab and that request would be made. And before this fix, it didn't have the CSRF token, it didn't have that protection. So I'm not entirely sure what a content editor could do to, um, to tweak that request and, and, and cause some, something bad to happen. But, but that, that is basically, um, that, that is as much as I know <laughs> about this vulnerability. Go ahead. Off of your previous example, if you install a like, remote, uh, re remote media entity, you can put a URL into a to a different site to let's say the delete page again as a remote entity. You know, forge part that part in that URL in as a remote entity. Then when someone brought up this page, it would try to display that in the image uh, source there, and then you would have the same effect and without the. Without right. that token, I think you have a problem. Right. So going back to the description of, of the um, of the vulnerability, it does mention internal and external media. Oh, okay. So so okay. So, so as you suggest, um, maybe it's not a local media file, but a remote one, um, which involves um, a URL to some external site, um, and yeah, that that might be how it's exploited. Um, not sure. And that would certainly make it a cross-site yeah. vulnerability rather than uh, same site. Um, any other questions, comments about this? So um, I'm supposed to finish at 10.45. So, um, so I, as I said, I'll, I'll give you a choice. Do you want to talk about? Um, Injection, which is Drupal Geddon, or do you want to talk about uh, vulnerable and outdated components? These are three and six on, on the top ten list. Three. Yeah, little bobby tables. <laughs> <laughs> you, uh, you can already see in the preview what's coming up. Okay, so let's talk about um, A03, which is injection. Um, and uh, there are several different types of injection. Um, one is SQL injection, which is what I'll, I'll talk about here. Um, 
You can also have malicious JavaScript on a page. That's considered injection too. And the official description from OWASP is that user supplied data is not validated, filtered, or sanitized by the application. Um, dynamic queries are used directly in the interpreter. In other words, executing PHP code supplied by the user. I hope that no one is using the PHP filter on any PHP 7, any Drupal 7 sites, or God forbid, installed. I think it's available as a contrib module for Drupal 9. Um, hostile data is used within search parameters to extract additional sensitive records. Hostile data is directly used or concatenated. Um, and you can see the, the ellipses scattered through this slide. Um, you, you can follow the link there if you want the uh, full description. Um, and yes, this is uh, exploits of a mom. It's XKCD 327. I'm, Happy that XKCD also provides uh, a very um, generous license uh, for, for using their, their cartoons. Um, and on the phone call, hi, this is your son's school. We're having some computer trouble. Oh dear, did he break something? In a way, did you really name your son Robert? Close quote, paren, right paren, semicolon, drop table students, semicolon, dash, dash. Oh yes, little Bobby Tables, we call him. Well, we've lost this year's student records. I hope you're happy. And I hope you've learned to sanitize your database inputs. <laughs> so this gets into the idea of, of the, the incorrect assumptions that we make. Um, you expect to see Robert Smith entered as the name, but if Robert and this string of uh, of, of SQL code gets entered, and then you just concatenate that. Um, I, I, I should be a little more explicit about that, how that happens, because it's probably not obvious to everyone. But if you end up dropping the, the student's database table, if, that, if they've correctly guessed that that is what you call your database table name, if, if they get you to drop your, your student's table, then you're in trouble. Um, so this is how it was communicated. It was SA Core 2014-005. Drupal 7 includes a database abstraction API to ensure that queries executed against the database are sanitized to, protect, to prevent SQL injection attacks. A vulnerability in this API allows an attacker to send specially crafted requests resulting in arbitrary SQL execution. This can lead to privilege escalation, arbitrary PHP execution, or other attacks. This can be exploited by anonymous users. This was fairly early in my Drupal career in 2014. Um, I was sort of lucky that I read this the day it came out and my jaw dropped. Arbitrary PHP execution and exploited by anonymous users. I don't want to see those two lines in the same message. Um, and uh, I, I, patched, I, I updated the site that I was responsible for that afternoon. Um, and my response to this, I sent an email to my boss and to the client. Um, and I, I'm doing this from memory, I might not have it quite right, but, the, but what I wrote is because of the severity of the vulnerability and the simplicity of the update, we tested and updated the site today. So I should have gotten a medal for that um, because um, I guess I didn't quote it here, but a follow-up was sent a few weeks later. Um, and, and, and this wasn't called Drupal Geddon in the initial announcement. I, I read you basically the initial announcement. Um, but a few weeks later, people realized that there had been automated attacks within seven hours of the release of that. So if you updated your site within seven hours, you were probably safe. And if you didn't, sorry. Um, and I, I want to look at the code here. I know this, is, this, is, this won't make sense to everyone, um, but it's only a couple of slides. Um, so the vulnerable code was for each data as i goes to value, new keys 
of key concatenated with an underscore and dollar i gets the value. And the point is that that dollar i, the, the key in the data array, um, was concatenated with something and then um, and then the fixed code was just to replace data with array values of data. So replace the keys, which we don't know what they are, could be any string, replace the keys with 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on. So that was the fix, one line fix. So that's what I referenced in my, my email, that not only is it a serious vulnerability, but it's a very simple fix. And um, in my opinion, the actual bug is not the line that was fixed, but comes a few lines later. And the actual problem is that we take this query, we do a PREG replace, and there's that key that we sort of assumed was, was innocuous, and replace it with implode of comma, array, and, and the array keys of the new keys, I guess, is, um, is, is what's getting inserted. And I've actually added line breaks so that you can see this on one slide. In the code, that is actually one line. And you can see this seven line comment above it. Update the query with new placeholders. P reg replaces necessary, blah, 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 blah. Um, and I guess that's the last slide I have here. So, so, so my, my point here is that this code is too complicated. It's doing too much in one line. If you need a seven line comment to explain what you're doing, maybe it shouldn't be one long line of text, <laughs> of, of code rather. Um, and just as I said, custom code is always suspect because it doesn't get the level of code review that, um, that public code gets. Um, code that's hard to follow is bad code and is potentially insecure code. So good practices of writing good code are going to generally lead you to more secure code. Um, and I guess I have used up my time, so let me just briefly run through my conclusion slides. Um, so I reprise the summary, the outline of the talk, which we saw at the beginning. Um, I give you some references to my slide decks and the source files for them. Um, OWASP top 10 and the top 10 for 2021, a link to the Drupal security team, a link to the core release cycle describing major, minor, and patch releases, um, a link to the security advisories for Drupal core and contrib modules. Um, I have a couple of biases that showed up yesterday. I'm biased in favor of Drupal core and I sometimes forget to consider contrib modules. So someone pointed out yesterday, there is a contrib module that lets you filter permissions both by role and module, um, but I neglected that. Um, but here are some contrib modules that are important. There's the security review module, um, the paranoia module, which looks for instances of PHP eval. Um, there's the security kit, which lets you set a content security policy, um, uh, changes to avoid cross-site scripting and so forth. Um, there's Garter, which is a distribution for Drupal uh, with security in mind, and I know that um, Mark Shropshire is one of the maintainers of that. There's the two-factor authentication module, um, and I know that uh, Jonathan Daggerhart is one of the maintainers of that module. Um, not, e not all of these contrib modules have full releases, um, I'm sure that Jonathan would love to have some help getting two-factor authentication towards a full release. It's, I think it's still an alpha. Um, and yeah. So and, any questions before we break? We are, I'm afraid, three minutes over time already, but happy to talk later. I'll be around all day. Do you have a, then. Do you have a, a 
a favorite uh, vulnerability? Oh, it's Drupal Geddon because I patched my site within the seven hour time window. <laughs> I'm sorry, and I should have repeated the question for the recording. The question was, do I have a favorite vulnerability? Yeah. The best place to start learning more if you want to beef up your knowledge with some of The best place to learn more if you want to beef up your knowledge, um, if you look at, uh, not this slide, but the um, Drupal security team or, or security advisories. There are some links there. Um, so in the right sidebar, security announcements. You can also get RSS feeds, contacting the security team. And down here, writing secure code. If you are a Drupal developer, please read the handbook section on writing secure code. So that's a good place to start. Thanks. Welcome. Yeah. Can we talk about your journey to the, become a part of the security team at some point? Can we talk about my journey to become part of the security team? Um, sure. I think it would probably, probably right now is not a good time um, uh, just because of the schedule, but I'm happy to talk about it cool. later. OK, well, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Big red button, right? Uh-oh. <laughs>